à Cambridge, elle a été ensuite enseignante et puis postdoc à, à Cambridge et Cambridge. Donc elle vient aujourd'hui présenter son ouvrage euh, qui est paru en juillet 2021 oui, ça, ça. chez Florentieux. Ça s'appelle History Back with Ireland, Making It Popular Social History of the North American Nationality. Thank you very much, Arnaud. Uh, okay. You have, you have a book? Uh, no, I don't, because I'm traveling with, with already many bags, <laughs> um, and uh, no, I don't, but uh, I've got some pictures of the cover. Um, it's, it's uh, those of you who know British university publishing houses, the price is outrageous, so I'm just hoping I sell enough to get a paperback, and then maybe I can uh, start distributing, distributing it more liberally. Um, well, thank you so much for having me um, at your seminar this evening. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so I'm going to start today with um, popular history in the 1960s, in 1960s Britain. So in his 1994 magnum opus on popular history, Theatres of Memory, the British Marxist historian Raphael Samuel explained that it was in this decade, the 1960s, that the British discovered old photographs. This was part, according to Samuel, of a wider explosion of DIY popular history. He, he argued that popular culture was, in this moment, exploding with Victoriana, with local exhibitions and oral history projects popping up in schools and museums across the country. Around the same time, um, in 1964, museum curator Enid Porter, who we see here on the slide, um, was presented with the original manuscript of the diary of a 19th century draper, which she spent the next 10 years transcribing um, for a popular history book on everyday life in Victorian Cambridge. Now, going back to Samuel in Theatres of Memory, and I guess some of you might know this book, um, he, he goes on to explore that by the 1980s, people were even retrofitting their homes as a throwback to the 19th century. He, and he was arguing, really, that professional historians of social history had been slow to notice and appreciate what was happening to popular social history in post-war Brit Britain through the endeavours of women like Enid Porter and her Draper's Diary. Now, Samuel saw this kind of as an ideological divide, I think. He thought that this ignorance had a lot to do with the condescension of the left-wing academy towards ordinary people and their activities and interests, especially in a Thatcherite landscape of the 1980s, in which uh, many academics felt that those ordinary people had sort of sold themselves out to individualism and, com and commerce commercialization. And his provocations kind of against his, his comrades sparked a quite bitter set of debates between himself and other, other scholars, Robert Hewison and Patrick White, known as the Heritage Wars throughout the 1980s and 1990s. So, um, although I don't disagree with Samuel, in fact, I don't disagree with Patrick Wright either, I've come to think that this battle over the ideological impulses behind popular history was quite misguided and actually sometimes quite distracting. Theatres of memory has really become kind of a totem for historians when we talk about popular history. It's a way of pointing to the gap between what we do inside universities and what ordinary people interested in history do outside in the world, in their homes, schools and communities. However, um, despite identifying this gap, I don't actually think that, that theatres of memory did much to explain the history of social history. To understand why people were collecting old photographs um, and why Ina Porter was transcribing that Draper's diary for 10 years, I think that instead of starting in the 1960s, like most histories of social history do, I think we need to start a few decades earlier, just after the end of the First World War. And this is the crucial point. We also need to think a lot less about academics, i.e. ourselves, and a lot more about mass education. So, uh, in my book, Histories of Everyday Life, The Making of Popular Social History in Britain, 1918 to 1979, I suggest that mass education was the primary driving force behind popular social history in 20th century Britain. 
And so the book tries to kind of uncover all the pedag pedagogical contexts surrounding popular historical activity in Britain since 1918, in schools, museums, publishing houses, local government, and on BBC radio. So my kind of one-line pitch of the book is that it's an, it's an alternative educational history of popular social history in modern Britain. And now this framing um, as an alternative educational history allows me to make um, two historiographical interventions in the book. Firstly, I argue that the 20th century was Britain's educational century. That is to say, education defined the 20th century. From the 1918 Education Acts in England and Wales and Scotland, to the raising of the school leaving age to 16 in 1972, and actually more recently to 18, but we're now in the 21st century, uh, the British state gradually committed to providing more secondary education for wider uh, parts of the population. And as a result, we see education becoming the primary economic and social justification for cultural ventures. And education was the arena in which all forms of knowledge were gradually democratised over the course of the 20th century. Now, um, this democratisation of knowledge, of course, happened through the interaction of, of a multitude of sometimes antagonistic forces. Ordinary people making claims for themselves, the state and elites managing access to knowledge, and intellectuals and activists producing theories about how knowledge is created and received. My book only deals with the democratization of historical knowledge, but I think that actually foregrounding mass education over expertise is a really helpful framing for understanding the diffusion of a much broader array, array of knowledges in popular culture, in, in Britain at least. So that's the first intervention. Secondly, I am actively concerned to tilt the history of social history away from a great men narrative. In this effort, I very much stand on the shoulders of many um, feminist, uh, many other scholars and, and, a, and a rich pre-existing feminist scholarship. Women, as we, as we know, had long been involved in the production of popular history in Britain. As the work of the very sadly recently deceased Rosemary, Rosemary Mitchell has shown, as well as Billy Melman um, and Bonnie Smith in the US, they've shown us that in the 18th and 19th centuries, amateur female historians penned literary and picturesque histories for the commercial marketplace. And they were very financially successful in doing this, in writing books for children, um, and selling them. We've also got historians such as Maxine Berg and Amy Erickson who have shown how um, respectively female academics such as Eileen Power and Ellen MacArthur crafted histories informed by their progressive politics. However, Power and MacArthur were amongst the first professional women historians in Britain in the early 20th century. And what I do in my book is try to emphasize the wide range of historical activity undertaken by mid 20th century women in educational settings outside of universities. And indeed, I show that po this popular social history was actually a highly feminized construct. It was under intellectualized, aesthetic, and often associated with emotions. This was all part of its appeal to ordinary people. Although the renaissance of local history in the 1950s and history from below in the 1960s are most often associated with um, male academic class warriors, my book shows how in schools, museums and local government, it was women who built and ran the educational networks and indeed who maintained the emotional and psychological infrastructure that made the late 20th century history boom possible the boom that Samuel was writing about and that sparked his history wars. So that's my kind of overall pitch. Um, for the rest of the presentation, I, I'm, I've divided it up into three parts, okay? And they roughly correspond to three chapters of the book. So first, I'll explain the form of popular social history that I'm tracing throughout the book, which I've called the history of everyday life. In particular, I'll stress that this history of everyday life was at its core a pedagogical con construct designed to generate a certain type of historical knowledge for certain publics. Secondly, we'll dive into a case study of the history of everyday life in practice, 
which I, uh, look, sorry, looking at the broadcasting of history on BBC Radio between the 1930s and the 1960s. We'll see how the pedagogy of the history of everyday life was reproduced throughout Britain's 20th century educational culture. And finally, I, I need to tell you a bit about the decline of the, every, the history of everyday life, right? Every book needs to have an ending. Um, and I'll explain this by looking at what happened to the teaching of social history in the large, non-selective, multiracial, state comprehensive schools of the 1970s in England. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, the book traces popular social history across many educational settings. It's a popular social history that I've called the history of everyday life. But what was the history of everyday life? And the was is really important here. I need to emphasize to you that I'm not talking about the same thing as late 20th century, 21st century academic history of everyday life, which we can say emerged in the 1990s as a result of, of the application of, of post-structuralism to historical practice and the cultural turn away from the old social history. The history of everyday life that I'm talking about uh, was a distinctively mid-century, effective, local and feminized way of imagining and representing uneventful lives in the past. It was the story of the individual, her material environment, her routine skills, the objects and the things that she owned at home and at work. It was unconcerned with outward social structures or political events. So here I'm saying this is not a socialist social history to uncode my, my uh, way of writing it. The history of everyday life was, was applied by its many advocates and practitioners to lives across all periods from prehistory to the recent past. So it's a really promiscuous form of social history, right? It's, in its core, it's educational. So I've given you a few examples on the slide. Um, the first picture on the left, if you can see it, is the cover of the first volume of Charles and Marjorie Cornell's A History of Everyday Things in England series, which were published between 1918 and 1934 and remained in print until the late 60s. And I see these books kind of as the, the foundational and most iconic expressions of the history of everyday life. It's like the thesis statement of the history of everyday life. And on the right, we've also got a picture of the curator of the Jeffrey Museum in East London, Molly Harrison. Um, she's showing her, her reconstructed period room to a group of school children. Harrison saw the history of everyday life as a way of challenging Britain's archaic elitist museums establishment. She used it to offer a radical, bottom-up interpretations of um, art and consumerism to working-class Londoners, both during and after the Second World War. Now, unlike the academic version of the history of everyday life, the lives talked about were not always those of the marginalised. So this isn't a, nor is this a kind of subaltern his kind of history. Everyday life sometimes could mean the ordinary lives of extraordinary individuals, like what did the queen eat for breakfast? But I argue, overall, that the goal of the history of everyday life was to evoke subjective historical experiences for ordinary people in the present, a way for them to understand their place in the changing mid-century world around them. The history of everyday life drove the democratisation of historical knowledge in 20th century Britain, but this happened within a tightly defined pedagogical framework. Who got to learn and participate in different kinds of popular histories was dictated by social class, by gender, and later by race and ethnicity. Educationalists constructed the history of everyday life for the post-1918 classroom, museum and airwaves, as a form of new social history for, the, for less able, non-elite pupils, right? soon to be ordinary citizens, consumers, etc. Now, the origins of this, which I talk about in the book as a pedagogical discourse of ordinariness, can be very precisely located, I think. After the First World War, Britain's formal education system was falteringly reoriented towards a system of mass secondary education. The year 1918 saw the passage of an Education Act for, Ind for, for England and Wales, which enlarged local authority powers and set the wheels in motion for the expansion of secondary education. Uh, any scholars here of the interwar period will know that reform was limited because the education budget is, is often the first to be cut. Um, 
So state education in the interwar period in England and Wales was basically still elementary um, to the age of 12, maybe sometimes 14. And the provision of, of new secondary education really varied between regions. Scotland followed a different trajectory. The Education Scotland Act of 1918 was actually a far more, far more robust underpinning for a system of secondary education for all. It already raised the school leaving age to 15, okay, something that didn't happen for England and Wales until 1947. And it strength, strengthened the curricular provision of, of core academic subjects in those schools. Now, having said all this, um, even though elementary schools continued to be the kind of dominant form of education in the interwar period, this is a really important time because the nature of the new edu secondary education system was being hotly debated. Educationalists needed to establish what these new modern pupils in a system of mass secondary education would be taught. Okay, they had to design a whole new curriculum for a whole new co constituent, and they needed to justify it in terms of its social value um, for, for pupils and its economic value to the state and on the labour market. So uh, there's, a, there's a report that I'm going to talk about that I think sums all this up. The Board of Education's Consultative Committee's report of 1926 was called The Education of the Adolescent, also known as the Haddo Report. This report addressed the question of education beyond the age of 11 for the majority of the population. But crucially, it did not concern itself with what was taught in grammar schools. Right? So grammar schools are being preserved they're, they're for a minority of pupils who want to progress further in education. The Haddo Report was talking about the rest, the majority. The Haddo Report made a lot of important recommendations, but I'm going to focus on what it said about the curriculum. I argue that the Haddo Report was really significant because it offered the first clear articulation of this modern pupil type. Excuse me, are we supposed to work your prayers and swim? At 5.30 today, no, no, no. This room is booked until 6.30. Well, at least you know the screen you have at the, at the, when you enter. No, I think well, you just have a picture if you want to double check. So um, the Hadda report, I'm talking about it, it, its curriculum, and it offered, um, I think, the first clear articulation of the modern pupil type. Hadda's fourth chapter recognised, quote, the need of bringing the curriculum in relation with local conditions, end quote. And so it argued that the sub subjects studies, studied um, should be similar to those studied in grammar schools, but for the modern pupil, they needed to be more closely related to, quote, the living texture of industrial or commercial or rural life. And so for Haddo, the local environment was uh, a really crucial medium, particularly for these non-academic pupils. Here's a quote that I think kind of sums it up um, in a very long, long document. Quote, we regard it, and this is from the Haddo report, sorry if that's not clear. Um, we regard it as most important that in modern schools and senior classes, the teaching in several subjects of the curriculum should have throughout the course some relation to the local environment. And it should be brought into close association with the everyday surroundings of the pupils. This will secure their interest and show them the bearing of the teaching upon the facts of their everyday life. Haddo's recommendations filtered down into teacher training, into the new experimental secondary schools, and were reproduced and reinforced in later government policy, notably the 1944 Education Act. The 44 Act, also known as the Butler Act, mandated that all English and Welsh local authorities had to provide a variety of secondary educational provision um, and it abolished fees in the grammar schools, so it was um, uh, opening up those schools as well. What happened is most local authorities um, responded to this mandate by implementing um, either a tripartite or a bipartite system, and they used the 11-plus examination to allocate pupils to, um, to different kinds of school, either to the grammar schools, the non-academic secondary modern schools, or the vocational technical schools. So 1944, the Butler Act, this crucial reform, marked the realisation of mass secondary education in Britain. But most importantly for my argument, it left these Haddo principles intact, right? The purposes and aims of education for modern pupils. As secondary education expanded, the history of everyday life was conceived 
as a suitable social history for ordinary pupils, and hence ordinary people in society, because it was related to everyday experience. From the 1920s to the 1960s, non-academic, average ability and younger pupils were much more likely to learn this local environmental social history just as Haddo had recommended. And so he, I'll put it plainly, here's the point that I want to insist upon. The bifurcation of historical knowledge in mid 20th century Britain between social history and political history, between the material and the emotional and the intellectual and the abstract was actually coded into the class and gender bound logic of its educational structures. And in the book, I, I, I can't go into this into detail, but in the book I show that the, pre, the three principal characteristics of this social history um, for ordinary peoples were local, visual, and emotional. Um, in the interwar period, the local often revolved around school visits to like local churches and historic sites and even factories. As for the visual, there were many efforts already in the 1920s to produce high quality history films history teaching films for these ordinary pupils. Remember, this is the moment when cinema explodes and there's a lot of concern about young people um, kind of being brainwashed by American cinema. On the slide, I, I've given you a 1924 proposal for a film on the Industrial Revolution, which was supposed to trace processes of woolen manufacturing in Yorkshire in 1700. Um, and it had lots of different scenes set in a uh, clothier's yard, on a sheep farm, and in a spinner's house. Um, what's interesting to me about this, this uh, film proposal is how, close, how it pays close attention to the aesthetic setting of the interiors, the time of day and the weather. They're all background to the processes of production. But I think they're also devices um, designed to connect the everyday lives of the school children in the audience to this abstract historical process. They, they make it more real, right, related to the environment. These pedagogical tendencies continued in the post-1945 secondary modern schools. Remember, those are the schools for non-academic pupils who don't get into the grammar schools. Um, uh, and these schools often uh, didn't have many curricular restraints or exam criteria, so history teachers could take advantage and, and plan their lessons freely. So I've put a couple of quotes on the slide from, from history teachers um, talking about what they did, and we see more of the history of everyday life. So one teacher said, I found the best way was to make people live and encourage people to use their imagination. Um, these might be real people like Florence Nightingale or, a, or an imaginary peasant living next door in their village. Another teacher based in Cumbria organized uh, field trips to Hadrian's Wall on the border with her teenage pupils. And she liked teaching social history because she said, history is about human beings as well as about events. And I think children get so involved in social history. She argued that the Industrial Revolution, illustrated by local examples, allowed, um, allowed the children to, to empathise with history, and she said they enjoyed it. This, this thing about fostering an emotional connect in, connection to the past, achieved through emphasising human experiences, was a really common feature of the history of everyday life, and often associated with female pupils. Now, before moving on, um, I've got a bit of a bee in my bonnet about secondary modern schools, so I just want to stress to you how widespread and significant this kind of history teaching was. Until the 1970s, when the whole system was reformed, we'll get to that, the vast majority of pupils in England and Wales were attending secondary modern schools. On the graph, we can see that at its peak in 1962, over 800,000 girls and boys are in this type of school. And at the same time, you've got about 350,000 girls and boys, respectively, in grammar school. So this really is where the majority of pupils are getting their education. In 1963, the Ministry of Education published the Newsom Report, which was all about the present state and future of secondary education for the majority of ordinary non-academic pupils in the secondary modern schools. And I think it's really interesting how the report introduces these pupils. It refers to them as half the citizens of this country, half the workers, half the mothers and fathers, and half the consumers. So again, we're reminded of the clear connection drawn between pupils in these secondary schools and their future role as productive citizens. Their education should not be connected to abstract intellectual ideas, but to everyday life in the modern welfare state. 
And in, in the case of history, the history of everyday life helped fulfill this function. Um, so moving on to a little case study, what did the history of everyday, everyday life look or sound like in practice in other places? A major aim of my book is to show that these pedagogical discourses about ordinary people and their access to historical knowledge were not confined to schools or niche educational spaces. Right, so this is a, a thing that we, ha that we have, I think, in modern British history where the history of education tends to be a bit ghettoized and tends to be focused on schools and what happens in schools. And I really wanted to, to look at other places to show that there's actually a, a huge circulation of ideas. So the second part of my book explores the diffusion of the history of everyday life into the educational industries of the mid-century, including broadcasting via the, the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. The BBC was formed as a consortium in 1924 and was endowed with a public monopoly in 1926. And it really stood at the helm of Britain's mission to educate its new democracy between the wars. Under John Reith, who we see here on the slide, the first DG, the BBC has been widely noted um, as a sort of institution that was geared towards a very paternalistic form of liberal democratisation. I think this, this Reithian project, shall we call it, is quite well defined in the historiography on the BBC, but I think more needs to be done to kind of connect the BBC's cultural interventionism with the wider discourses of education in the mid-20th century. In the third chapter of my book, I show that during from uh, the period from, say, the mid-1920s to the mid-1960s, the BBC subscribed to modes of the history of everyday life because it put the listener in touch with, quote, the real world. The BBC positioned itself as reaching out to the new, constitu to new constituents whose appetites for democracy and education had been stimulated by the First World War. And this isn't just soldiers coming back from the front. This is also women who have just been enfranchised and will be more enfranchised in 1928, and juvenile school leavers. So for the BBC, the aim was... Um, uh, making academic subject ma matter more relevant, this aim was widespread across the corporation, and it was particularly oriented towards new publics. Throughout its first decade in existence, the BBC developed its adult education policy in relation to um, the major adult education institution um, of the time, the Workers' Education Association, or WEA. But by the mid-1930s, I think it's abundantly clear um, from policy documents, that the BBC didn't want to be regarded as a formal body of adult education in the same way as the WEA. It wanted to be a liberal distributor of broadly educative material for an audience who were listening at home, rather than organised in WEA classrooms. So the BBC does experiment with some kind of listening groups, um, but it's not a hugely successful model, and so it kind of shifts in the 1930s towards this more um, liberal broad model. The BBC's first major inquiry into adult education was, by no coincidence, chaired by Sir Henry Haddo, the same man behind the Board of Education's Consultative Committee report of 1926 on adult education. As I explained earlier, that Haddo report had argued for a system of mass education attuned to people's environments. The BBC's 1928 report made similar claims for its general adult education. They are, after all, addressing the next, the next life stage of those ordinary pupils, right? Male and female, who were attending secondary schools for the first time. The requirements of a new and inclusive democracy of listeners, the report argued, could not be satisfied by a scheme of adult education devised, quote, for industrial workers whose interest is chiefly in economic and political problems. So instead, um, they, promote, they uh, propose a model of teaching all subjects through, quote, familiar objects and experiences. Sounds familiar. In the case of history, this is what the report said. Experience has shown that it is also possible to deal with history in such a way as to link it to the interests and experience of listeners who have no particular historical sense and who can only be brought to visualise the past if it is made to exist for them, not in dates and lists of events, but in a form which has some relation to themselves and their own lives. 
Guided by these pretty clear principles, in the interwar period, BBC history programming was broad and eclectic. Although professional historians were, of course, invited onto the airwaves to give traditional narrative lectures, so we have Eileen Power, we have GM Trevelyan, we have Harold Beals, we can also locate a strong vein of, of leisure history broadcasting, which was far less adherent to sort of disciplinary academic norms. These programmes were particularly geared towards housewives. Any of you who study the BBC know it's got a bit of an obsession with what housewives want to listen to and how to capture their interest. After 1918, with the enfranchisement of women over the age of 30, some women over the age of 30, this need to feminise messages of citizenship were freshly apparent. The political culture of post-suffrage Britain was suffused with constructions of and communications with the female citizen, and the BBC's history programming was no exception. So, for example, in 1933, the social worker Grace Haddo broadcast a series of talks on the National Service, which also widely promoted in The Listener, the BBC's educational magazine. Her series was called Exploration at Home, and it was all about discovering amateur historical pursuits in your own house or garden. I've put on the, on the slide there... I don't know if I can... If you can see that. <laughs> um, that that's her opening, opening uh, gambit from the first talk. Um, these talks are not attended for experts, she said. They do not profess to be more than jottings from notebooks, which have been kept for many years and from which time to time I have entered odds and ends collected from books or from people. Suggestions which gave fresh inter interest to the ordinary surroundings of everyday life and led to further reading and research. So you can see this language of everyday life is everywhere in the sources. Um, and it's not a, 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 a political language, right? It's really about everyday life and individuals. So in her talks, she, she um, gives historical facts and she cribs and quotes from authoritative sources into a kind of do-it-yourself guide to the history of everyday, everyday life. And Haddo, um, in, her, in her talk, spoke as if she was sort of learning along with the listener and she makes constant, constant references to other historical works. Haddo is really, I think, here assuming a specifically gendered form of deference towards expertise, and she really styles herself as an interpreter rather than an, hist an historian. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, as part of my chapter on the BBC, uh, a part of my chapter on the BBC is also um, dedicated to the evolution of history broadcasting for schools um, and the way in which new radiophonic technologies such as sound effects, music and dramatic interludes generated a history of, of everyday life for ordinary pupils in schools listening to BBC radio. I can't go into that in detail, but I'll give you a few examples. Over the course of the 1930s and 40s, BBC school scriptwriters and producers had experimented with a, with a new radiophonic technique known as the eyewitness, later observer technique. This involved taking a major historical event um, and telling it from the point of view of an ordinary bystander, effectively inverting the perspective from top down to bottom up. Bottom up. So I'll give you an example. In June 1933, we have a talk for schools entitled Caxton's Printing Press which took the form of a dialogue between an ordinary woman and a scribe. The woman explains to the scribe why the coming of print is, is beneficial to the people. And that their conversation is set out amidst crowds um, outside Caxton's workshop in 1477. And inside, you've got Edward IV inspecting the new press. But we're not inside with Caxton and the king. We're outside with the scribe and the ordinary woman. The Observer technique was used to its fullest effect in the landmark series How Things Began, a concoction of prehistory, archaeology, natural history and geography, which was first broadcast during the war. From 1943, the series featured an adult guide um, named Uncle Jim. And Jim every week explored prehistory with two ordinary school children, Alice and George, the very 1950s. Uh, they would not be called Alice and George today. Um, and Alice and George were encouraged by Jim to go out and explore things near their house, such as a local chalk pit, to see what they could find. And then, in each episode, Jim would travel back in time to collect further evidence to illustrate his explanations. This device seamlessly connected the modern to prehistory, making the deep past appear 
as familiar and as, ev and as everyday to pupils as the radio set in their living room. How Things Began became one of the most popular schools broadcasts of the 50s and 60s, running roughly until 1968. Um, and, and, and listener research showed that it's really this observer technique that was hooking people. We even have some evidence of adults listening to the series. In 1947, a senior BBC scriptwriter received a letter from a 75-year-old listener thanking her for the beautiful pictures portrayed in How Things Began. He wrote, I have a very vivid imagination. I often sit here all on my lonesome, looking out over the fields and I conjure up a picture of 10 or 20,000 years ago, watching the primitive man searching for berries, roots and leaves, etc. The writer of this letter, George Leitz, goes on to explain that he had left school at, at 12 to go to work, pretty uh, normal, um, and he asked for recommendations of books that he could, he could get to learn more. And he responded when he'd, he'd ordered the books that he could now finally study history that he should have done years ago. And he said, here sitting in my farm workers' cottage uh, half a mile from the nearest house is a delightful situation for me to contemplate the past. There's not that much concrete evidence in the BBC archives um, determining how many adult listeners like, like Leeds were enjoying the History School's broadcast. Um, in 1940, the Listener Research Department conducted an, an, an inquiry into adults listening, and they found that this was, it was pretty widespread, um, and that history was the, favorite, the second favorite subject after music. And that pretty much um, tallies with everything we know about BBC, right? That, that music always is the most popular, and it's the thing that the BBC want to broadcast the least under wreath. Um, so these two brief examples, I hope, demonstrate how new hybrid forms of social history were invented for BBC Radio in order to satisfy this wider discourse of pedagogical ordinariness that they were signed up to. Ordinary people needed a particular form of social history, the history of everyday life, um, and the, the idea was the BBC was signed up. This was rarely a socialist history, or was, or was it, uh, it was never focused on collective strugg struggles. It was more often oriented towards selfhood, subjective, personal encounters with the material, sensory, and emotional experiences of the past. And again, if you know a bit about the BBC in the interwar period, this works pretty well from th for them because they really don't want to be associated with anything that looks too left-wing. Um, and there's a kind of famous debacle around the, around the general stri strike where they sort of capitulate to the government because they're, they're often accused of being on the left. In fact, they... They still are often accused of being on the left. So the history of everyday life works, and it gives them a form of history that, that solves this political problem for them. The prevalence of, of women in leading these projects should also be noted. Um, educated middle-class women often found this educationally-oriented environment of the BBC gave them the opportunity to, to make histories when they weren't able to access university careers in the same way. But this also involved a degree of gender deference and acceptance of the limits being placed on them by their historical expertise. Okay, in the little bit of time that I've got left, um, 10 minutes or so, I just want to give you some insight into my argument about why the history of everyday life declined in the 1970s. And we'll do this by looking at the teaching of history in English comprehensive schools during that tumultuous decade, the 1970s. Bit of background. In the English context, comprehensive schools are secondary schools that do not select their intake. They're usually educating pupils from, from 11 to 16 or 18. The selective system that arose from the 1944 Act that I explained earlier stayed in place until the 1960s, but parents and pupils were agitating for change as early as the 1950s. And the problem for them was that if your child went to a secondary modern school, they were very unlikely to get access to a school leaving qualification, and parents recognised the value of those qualifications on the labour market. Also, at the beginning of the 60s, we get a lot of sociological research providing quite hard evidence of how unfair the selection process was, um, especially the lack of working class access to the grammar schools. So to cut a very long, complicated story short, by the 1970s, comprehensive schools were Britain's principal vehicle of mass secondary education. In 1972, there were 100, nearly 120,000 more girls, 130,000 more boys at comprehensive schools than at secondary modern. So this is the moment of transition, right, where you've still got some 
grammars and, and, and secondary mods and still some comps. Comps take over by the early 70s. As well as functioning as sites of social class mixing, the rise of comprehensive schooling also led to significantly more gender mixing in the schools. 83% of all comps were co-educational by 1972. Um, and this kind of sparks a whole, a whole uh, trend where we start to see girls outperform, outperform boys in secondary schools so that by the year 2000, they're actually outperforming boys in Britain in higher education too, a trend that continues to today. As well as gender, race was another key factor in the social demographics of these new schools. The establishment of the new comprehensive system coincided with an increase in the number of pupils of colour in Britain's secondary education system. The first Windrush generation of immigrants had been mostly single adults, but by the early 70s, children in black British and black A uh, British Asian families who had arrived from the 60s were reaching secondary school age, right? They were getting to be age 11. We've also got family reunion migrants attached to earlier waves of South Asian migration becoming, um, adding to these numbers. Throughout this period, um, the British state used the designation immigrant pupil to describe these children. Um, and for the, for the state, an immigrant pupil was a child born outside of Britain or a child born in Britain whose parents had lived in Britain for less than 10 years. And I, I won't use this term, obviously, but um, if anyone wants to talk about that, it's a very interesting story about how they collect these statistics that I've put on the slide. So all that context on, on comprehensive is to say that in the 1970s, history teaching in comprehensive schools was really faced with a much wider social makeup of pupils, encompassing class, race, gender, and ability. And this was compounded for history teachers by the problem of how to teach the history of the British Empire to all pupils in the context of decolonization and decline. So what I argue about this in the book essentially is that in an effort to respond to these rapidly changing and intersecting needs, educationalists and teachers instinctively linked the history of everyday life to this very problematic project of multicultural history in comprehensive schools with fairly disastrous results for pupils of colour. Multicultural history, I think, was such a problematic pursuit in the comprehensive school because the legacy of the history of everyday life reinforced the relationship between race, gender, and low attainment. Remember, it was always a history for low ability pupils. Well-intentioned practices could result in ethnic minority pupils being prescribed these kinds of histories, existing so social history and social education courses that were, that were designed for ordinary or, or low ability pupils. I'll give you a couple of examples. At Twyford Comprehensive School in West London, the needs of pupils facing literacy difficulties, and again, there's a link there with um, pupils of colour because they might have English as a second language or they might speak a patois if they're coming from the Caribbean. So those pupils and the needs of ethnic minority pupils were, were put together and tackled simultaneously by introducing an integrated studies course, which uh, focused on contrasting studies of home and community in Britain, Asia, the Caribbean, West Africa and Europe. In another large multi-ethnic comprehensive school in Greater London, teachers sought to implement a colorblind approach to education, again by using this integrated studies approach, by combining history, geography, and social studies. The course addressed topics such as travel, customs, um, uh, colonization, but it was framed in the same pedagogical techniques that we've seen throughout this paper, developed to make social history appeal to lower ability pupils. And the staff at that school had looked at, at having what's known as a black studies curriculum, um, but they rejected it because they thought that it wasn't going to suit the white pupils in the school. Now, this tension of instilling relevant histories for both black and white pupils in, in multi-ethnic, ordinary, comprehensive schools is probably most starkly exposed when it came to how Africa was treated in history lessons. In English schools, there was a really strong tradition of the African continent basically only featuring as an aspect of transatlantic slavery. In the 1970s, a researcher at the University of Bristol surveyed teachers in the Southwest about how they taught African history. And, and she found that African history was taught in half the schools, um, but it was mostly taught as part of either slavery, partition, or colonialism, um, or the rise of independence in Africa, but there was, there was no teaching on solely African issues. 
Um, there's an overwhelming sense from these teachers that African history was just too remote and too different for white pupils. And some teachers felt that it was only appropriate for African Caribbean pupils to learn. These examples, I think, give you a bit of a flavour of the argument I make in the final chapter of the book. I haven't got time to go through all the different factors. I don't just talk about race. I also talk about the rise of exam culture, accreditation, the rise of uh, social studies. Um, so amongst other factors, I show how multicultural history pushed the construction of the ordinary pupil on which the history of everyday life had been predicated since the 1920s to its breaking point. In the 1970s, pupils of colour were becoming increasingly yoked to this pedagogical category of ordinariness in mass education, such as low ability, educational special needs, and early school leavers. Essentially, the history of everyday life links race to these other categories of ability in the context of, of these large schools. As ever, the ordinary pupil, it was, it was thought, required history to provide a social education that was relevant and accessible, but relevance was becoming racially qualified in quite a politically dangerous way. And we see establishment fears about the radical corollaries of, of, of black history in the context of the rise of, of black power in the USA. These debates are also present in debates about teaching multicultural history in the comprehensive school. And again, like this, is, this is an issue that we continue to see um, when, we, when we, in contemporary debates about the teaching of diverse or anti-racist histories in secondary schools. Okay, so to conclude, um, the history of everyday life d did not decline because academics and theorists like E.P. Thompson invented an alternative social history in the 1960s. It declined because its most limiting and discriminatory aspects were exposed through the teaching of history in comprehensive schools. When tested in the comprehensive, like a laboratory of social change, the history of everyday life fell apart under pressures of racialization and, as I said, accreditization, which I don't have time to speak about today. It was found that black and Asian historical actors could not simply be written into popular social history according to a kind of existing 1920s formula. Um, attempts to do so in the multicultural comprehensive school laid bare the direct line between the violence of the British imperial past and educational discrimination in the post-war, post-colonial present. Comprehensive education in the 1970s showed that the history of everyday life was basically no longer fit for purpose. Um, because it was a form of social history that did not speak to issues of power. And this is the point where there's a link to history of, the history from below, right? Um, we see these people starting to ask about power relations in history, and the history of everyday life just does not, just does not serve that. As one student of colour told interviewers in the mid-1980s about their school history teaching, quote, she said, they teach multicultural education but in a passive way. It's just lip service to it, really, end quote. So I started my presentation by suggesting that as academic historians, we've not been very good at understanding the character and development of popular history because we think it's got something to do with us and what we do. I don't think it does. I think it has everything to do with the interaction between mass education and pedagogy and with the ways in which the social categories of class, gender and race become interwoven with ability. In Britain, at least, academics are just not really very well connected to these things, I don't think. Until very, very recently, say, since the 1990s, um, before that, we weren't even teaching these kinds of pupils at university level at all. And now, at best, um, in Britain, we still only teach about 50% of the population who do go on to higher education. So in a way, it's like, why would we understand these things? <laughs> um, to, so at a minimum, I hope my book can encourage readers to ask themselves about the assumptions we make about who gets to learn what kind of history and why. Thank you. Should I stop? Yeah.